your, your background and what brought you here today. Uh, you were brought up in, uh, in Slima and then moved to Xira. What was your childhood like? It was the usual childhood without technology. We predate technology, we predate the internet. We used to play with other kids, read lots of books, at least in my case, in the absence of a tablet or a PC. I used to read a lot of books, especially science fiction. Um, I was into astronomy, I did an O-level in astronomy at one point. That was my first love, astrophysics and cosmology. Where is the universe going? Where did it come from? Um, scouts, a bit of everything really. What childhood used to be in the old days, before the screen. And what about your current family? Okay, I am married to a pharmacist, a community pharmacist, Angel. I have two kids called Elizabeth and Peter. Elizabeth is a second year medical student. Peter is studying accounts and economics and is doing his sixth form. We share the house with three Siamese cats. So you're fond of cats. Uh, were you the type of person who always wanted to be a doctor? No, actually. I um, did not want to be a doctor at any point in my life. I never had this calling. But I wanted to do, like I said, astrophysics and cosmology. But there were no BSCs available, so at the end of the day I had to choose what seemed to be the most interesting course available. And I am very glad and grateful I chose medicine because this has given me a marvellous springboard to do so many other different things in my life. The, the, the training that this, it gives you is, is perhaps unique in all the professions because you have to study biology, physics, chemistry, you end up studying psychology because you deal with people informally, so it gives you a huge background and you meet lots of different people who can give you, like yourself, who can give you access and insights into so many different things. It's wonderful. And why pediatrics? Pediatrics. Um, it's direct. It's, I've been described as being a bit like a vet, especially with babies, because babies can't speak, so it's like treating a little animal, if you like, because you can't have symptoms explained to you. And with older kids, it's very direct. There are no hidden agendas, there are no corners to explore. Children will be direct and will explain as well as their ability allows. So you find it very rewarding working with children. It's very refreshing. Uh, you graduated at the University of Malta, Correct. and then you went on to Great Ormond Street in London. Yes. Um, to um, do a PhD in uh, uh, cardiology. That's right. Um, how does it work, um, combining the pediatrics and the cardiology? You are the only um, pediatric cardiologist in Malta. So far, yes. There's a trainee yes. who's, who's very, very good. Another one on the way. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I will be replaceable, should something happen. But it, it, in medicine it works like this. You do your basic degree. Then you have two years in, med in hospital until you get your warrant. So you are everyone's um, little servant, little slave, little minion get things done for the consultant, then you finally start training, so in my case I did pediatrics, and then I decided to do pediatric cardiology. So I went over to Great Ormond Street, and that's where I started a PhD as well. And came back here and took over the pediatric cardiology. Mm -hmm. Which now is becoming a bigger department. Yeah. You see a lot of patients with congenital heart disease, you have speci specialized in that. Yes. And those go on to um, another department within Correct. cardiology. So, so cardiology is very vast. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's extremely vast. So there's the, fe the fetal cardiologist, there's the pediatric cardiologist like myself, and we deal mostly with structural problems, holes, valves, the leaky bits, narrow bits. It's a bit like plumbing which is very simple, so which is why I understand it so well. Uh, it's a bit like physics. Mm -hmm. If there's obstruction, you open it. If there's leakage, you sort it, there's a hole, you close anyway. And that, that's how it goes. Then, then there's adult cardiology. My kids grow up to, to become 16, of age, 16 years of age, and I pass them on to my counterpart, who is Dr. Marian Caruana. But the adult cardiologists, do so many different things. There's the EPs people, they, they deal with the electrics of the heart. Then there are the interventional cardiologists who stent arteries and do all these weird and wonderful things like implanting valves. Uh, it's, it's a very vast field actually, with, with not only specialization now, but sub, sub specialization. Mm -hmm. Little niches that everyone takes up. There's a colleague who does heart muscle only 
there is another colleague who who, who does um, the aortopathies, things that go wrong with the aorta. So it's, it's very finely nuanced now. And what's the ratio of patients, um, children, who will actually need um, cardiac services? Okay, so the percentage of kids who are born with congenital heart disease is about 1%. The vast majority need nothing, either small problems or problems that will resolve. A minority will need something, so if it's 1% of all deliveries here, let's say 40, 50 kids born with problems, I only end up sending about 20 patients to Great Ormond Street for surgery and maybe another 10 more that need intervention that can be done here, which is not quite open heart surgery but through a catheter. So, and some of these will be repeat clients so to speak, have had one intervention, need another one. Some of them we know, as soon as they're born, will need three interventions, possibly more. So there are recurrent patients. So considering not a huge proportion will actually need anything, thank God. The good thing about all this is that since it is plumbing, it is clever plumbing. That's what the surgeons do, very, very clever plumbing. So these are macroscopic things. These are things that you can touch, you can see, you can hold. So if there's an arrow bit, cut it out, rejoin it. There's a hole, somehow plug it. There's a leaky valve, somehow fix it, make it better. If needs be, you can replace it. So it's very rewarding because we, things can be done. Mm -hmm. And these kids grow up. I mean, we've, we have kids now who have retired. They're past their 60s and they have survived mm -hmm. surgery in childhood. And that's why it's a new speciality. You yeah. were you were the protégé, or are the protégé, of Jane Somerville, who is Emeritus Professor at Imperial College London. Correct. Um, how did that work out for you? It worked out very well. Uh, Jane, Jane, over the past 10 years, has watched my children grow, has become a family friend. Uh, she's like a mentor. We, we, we talk to each other about so many different things, just like my other colleague who, who also works in Birmingham, Joe De Giovanni. So it, you, one can be very lucky and find colleagues who think like you and who are older than you, wiser than you, far better than you, who can mentor you, who can advise you, not only about patients and about clinical aspects, because an email now and, you know, what do you think, have you seen a case like this before, how did you handle it, but more about everyday problems, you know, dealing with colleagues, dealing with, dealing with parents, the advice from these people can be invaluable, life lessons. So it is important, in your opinion, always to have a mentor? Always. Uh -huh. Always. And I hope I am a, a decent mentor to all of the junior colleagues who may consider me that. Yes. I would be honoured. I'm sure you are. I'd like to speak a bit about your, your fundraising work, your non-profit profit work, yeah. which is very vast now. Um, can, I mean, where do we start? Because you do a lot. Okay, back in 2018, I donated 150 of my paintings, which I do in my spare time, of which there is very little. But I donated 150 of my paintings, which had been languishing at home, two beating hearts mortar. We sold these mostly online, mm -hmm. interestingly, and we raised about 24K, no, 26K, and bought a portable echocardiography machine. Following that, this year, we, we've, we've done something new. So this is photography with a mobile phone, edited on a mobile phone, and we've paired the cities. So I've paired Manchester with the Grand Harbour, and I have paired Manhattan with Valletta. And we might be pairing with these latter to Toronto, but that's in the pipeline. Depends on one, one of our major sponsors, who is Remax. We might actually do a pairing of three cities, not two cities. So, in fact, the, the exhibition and the, and the book that comes out of this is called A Tale of Two Cities. So it but we'll stretch it. It might be a tale of three cities in, yeah. in the future. You pursued another PhD in a more quirky subject yes. and wrote some unusual papers. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Okay, like I said, I used to read a lot in childhood. I'm a minor expert on classical science fiction. Science fiction of the, especially the 40s, the 50s and the 60s, and to some extent the 70s. So I decided to do something with this knowledge of science fiction. I had approached my colleagues in English language, Ivan Carlos, Claire Vassallo, and the Dean, who's brilliant, Dominic Fenech, and they helped me to do this, like a very long essay, which eventually f focused on just one topic, 
the intersection of infertility and science fiction. So I know it's weird, but, but I know it's very weird, but a lot of papers came out of this. So infertility imposed on aliens, infertility imposed on us, for example, two classical works, just two very brief examples. 1984 by George Orwell, the state is working on eliminating the orgasm. There will be no love except love of Big Brother. Procreation will become an animal event. It's actually quoted in the book. Um, Brave New World, Soma. So you know, f free sex, complete contraception. That's how s sex and procreation is, is viewed. But everyone obviously is infertile. We only produce kids to replace. Mm -hmm. So sex is only for recreation, not for, for procreation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yes. Very interesting. I'd like to speak a bit about your new book, which is um, going to be launched very soon. Yes. Uh, with your name on the cover as well. With my name on the cover as well. Because <laughs> you have been instrumental in this yes. as well. Well, yes. You've helped a lot. Okay, the new book. Or Jane is, has, because well, she introduced it. Yes, yes. Jane. Has. Okay. <laughs> first principles, yes. Jane is the first principle. <laughs> <laughs> so we're seeing the book there, yes. There it is, yes. So this book concentrates on Oliver Frigiri's sketches. Oliver Frigiri is a well-known Maltese poet. You can see one of the sketches over there on the top. It's in black and white with the three birds. And what we've done in this book is nine chapters preceded by very lovely write-ups by the president, the prime minister, the archbishop, and so on. There are the interviews that you have done with all four authors on the book, which are myself, Richard England, uh, Oliver Frigiri himself and Arthur Larendal. And after that bit, then there are the actual nine chapters. So each chapter starts with a nice quote. And then there is Oliver Frigiri's poem in Maltese and in English pertaining to the topic in question, for example, rubble walls. Then there is a set of sketches of, of Oliver's. Then there is a painting of mine that depicts somehow rubble walls. There's a photograph of mine Again, taken with the mobile, on the mobile, the pitting rubber so, balls. You, I mean, uh, what we can explain is that you've paired your, yes, your art matched. with Oliver's, and Oliver's art is paired with his literature. Exactly. So, literature, the, po the poems, the painting, the photograph, a, a drawing by Richard England, and a relevant write-up by Arthur Lyondell, which mm -hmm. concludes each chapter very, very nicely. Mm -hmm. I'd like to speak a bit about Oliver himself. Uh, I mean, you got on very well with him. Yes. And you seem to look at certain things in the same way. Um, what are your thoughts about um, Oliver's art being, making his literature a whole when they're presented together? I think it, it, they do round off his work, or it, it's a nice symbiosis, it's a nice synergy to see these poems matched with one of his, one of his sketches, cause, or several of his sketches, because there are nine themes in all. Some sketches were unique in that there was only one book, for example, one candle. Some of them were more varied. He likes to draw pastoral scenes. So scenes of fields and, and rubble walls and churches, crucifixes, so an interesting variety. But mm. yes, I, I, I think it's a facet of his that, thanks to you, because you discovered that he sketches, um, we now I, have these sketches I, as well. I think many people discovered them. If it wasn't for you, the book wouldn't have happened yes, anyway. Um, the sketches, though, um, yeah. being twinned with his literature, um, he very much says that, lit um, that art was his first love yes. before literature. And this is, um, these, these uh, pieces of art are going to be published for the first time. Correct. So, in fact, the book, I believe, apart from um, the proceeds going to charity again, to um, support your non-profit work or have a lot of artistic merit. I think they do. It's the first time they're being published. No one knew about these. And it's nice to have them in one book, paired with, teamed, matched with, with all of this other material, including his own prose. I think it, each chapter ni rounds off nicely. Mm. Everyone I've shown them to has, has, has liked it. I gather he's very enthusiastic about it. Yes, he is. He, yes. he loves the idea. He didn't, he didn't expect this to happen. Yes, yes. But 
it was inevitable. And I believe everyone who's seen it has been thrilled yes, by them. has been enthusiastic. It's, it's a fairly unique piece of work. No one has done anything like this before, mm -hmm. to our knowledge. But, and so. where will the book be on sale? The book will be launched later on this month in a gallery in Valletta, and then it will be on sale in the various bookshops around the country. Professor Greg, thank you very much for coming again Pleasure. today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.